maybe a, a short story about Cardino, where um, EV Marketplace, used EV Marketplace started. In terms of my background uh, coming from sales management and, and consulting, so started my career with McKinsey, then did sales management, uh, delivery hero, before moving to building startups with Rocket Internet, which was my first interaction with no-code tools. And then when we decided to build Cardino two and a half years ago, actually the, the choice of no code as a first system that we used to, to actually build a business was kind of natural to us. Um, Why did you, like, how, can you just quickly tell us how, uh, how the idea of Cardino came up and then how did you get the first iteration? I think uh, I, I know that story. It's a very exciting one. Yeah, so... I think the very first interaction was when I was working with Rocket. So we, we looked into a bunch of spaces and something that I got super excited with was looking at this like crazy valuations and IPOs of Kazoo, Carvana's, Auto One, and the realization that the, the business models they built are not really the ones to scale, right? Like if you, if you think about it, what they build is basically big, big dealerships, big dealership groups, but not really the, the digital platforms. So I would say the first hunch was, hey, this is huge market, huge potential. We can actually do something to make it better, right? And then Henrik coming from sustainability, automotive background, actually brought this perspective of EVs. And for us, it was a perfect fit, right? We're building a, a marketplace for use assets that by design are digital, right? Like your Tesla, you, you manage it from your app, right? It would be so great if you had this journey of not only buying this car online, but also selling it online when, when you use it. And this is how we started. Um, I think we did it right in a sense of many first-time founders focus on let's build a pitch deck, let's try to pitch it to, to investors, let's try to get money. I think we, we, we really did it right with, I would say, bootstrapped approach, really trying to figure out whether the, what we tried to build makes sense. Um, and this is also, also kind of combining with the no-code journey that, that Cardino went through. Our first product was a, a landing page set on Notion and Super Site, which we built in literally three hours. And we started basically uh, bringing leads to our website who tried to sell cars. Uh, we made a lot of rookie mistakes, leaving phone number on the website. D don't do this. Everybody calls you and asks what's going on. Um, but basically the first months was really, really hacking together. How do, we, how do we make this concept of selling a car online actually work, right? And our first tech stack was Airtable was um, was basically WhatsApp, right? So I remember we had a discussion, right? I think the first 50 plus cars, 50 plus EVs that we sold in, in Cardino were actually sold via WhatsApp. They were not sold via platform. They were not sold by anything that was scalable by any means. But thanks to those learnings, we actually really knew what we need um, to, to actually build this business and scale this business, right? And from there, we obviously moved through iterations of how do we built a front end for dealers who buy from us um, to, to actually purchase cars. We went through Airtable that was shared with them. Then we put a software on top to, to make a nicer interface. Then we decided that we need something more complex. We built the first bubble app, right? And since then, we've been evolving this platform, uh, still actually operating majorly on no code. Uh, so I'm happy also to deep dive into this in a second. And maybe just in terms of metrics, can you share a bit, you know, what we were able to achieve, how much money you were able to raise, and also like, how much revenue or GMV you're handling, like whatever you can disclose. Yeah, so it, inside Cardino, we usually look into cars sold, right? As a kind of, you know, a North Star metric that also obviously results in GMV in revenue. I think the, the interesting metric I wanted to share is that when we launched our bubble platform last summer, we sold through it cars. Uh, last month we hit, right? So we basically 10X the business operating on, a, on an no-code platform, which is, crazy which is intense which has its own uh, on pitfalls as well um and during this journey we obviously raised quite a bit of money five million euros in total two rounds pre-seed and seed having basically no code tech stack right so not not really having a, a full code in place uh, when we raise ra raise this to two rounds uh, funding rounds and yeah gmv wise i think uh, i like to think that we're actually the biggest bubble-based marketplace GMV-wise because we're hitting probably this month something around million euros run rate uh, annual GMV, right? So this is crazy actually volume going through our platform given that we're still no code. I mean, to be honest, you are selling Tesla, so obviously the price is going to be high. <laughs> it's not like in the e-commerce, but uh, that's impressive. I think it's a, it's a good showcase of, you know, when people ask, can no code scale? 
well, to some extent, at least at the beginning, you know, you can be handling, you know, hundreds of millions of euros of uh, transaction uh, through a platform that is based on no code. I think it's a good, uh, it's pretty inspiring. Maybe can you share with us, you know, back in this or, or in these early days, maybe not, I guess recently you're getting more of those, but what were the, what was the biggest challenge that you had to tackle and where it, in, in, in that no code journey, can you, can you remember any specific functionality that was key? And that proved very difficult to beat within the existing uh, no-code stack you had back then. Huh? Yeah, so basically the dealer platform that we've built has an auction mechanism in it, which means basically multiple users come at the same time, place the bids, they bid against each other. So we have to have this like live performance, right? Which I think obviously took us a lot, a lot of time to figure out how to do this with Bubble. I think the the the... the I would say lucky, lucky outcome, or kind of you know the, the the real outcome is that when we actually invested time into figuring it out, it actually started to work, right? So, at the beginning, we had huge problems because it would take up to ten seconds to register your bid, which means that if there is ten seconds to to finish the auction, actually it's impossible for for dealer to actually to actually win this car. We basically brought it down to milliseconds right now, where we have even a hot bidding phase, right? Where basically dealers in the last ten seconds, if they place a bid. Basically, the, the auction duration extends and other dealers can also place their bids, right? So we really managed to go from the process which wasn't really working or wasn't scalable to the to the one where we can have tens of users participating at the same time on this live auction and actually having a great experience of actually bidding on this car. So I think this is one particular, I would say, later stage functionality, obviously in the in the in the very, very beginning. We had a lot of issues um, connected to how do we even run this process with you know Airtable, Bubble, how do we run the connections between the two? Uh, because our choice of Bubble also meant that a lot of backend functionalities were moved to Bubble, but our company was still running on Airtable, right? And I think to this date, we still have a lot of, I would say, debt to, to pay in this area. And what uh, what's the least no-code uh, uh, part of your infrastructure? What, what's the part where actually no-code kind of failed you early and you had to invest in getting some kind of you know technical parts? Up. So I would say these are mostly the elements of certain workflows, right? So I wouldn't say there is one full process that we actually took off no low code um, tech stack. However, when, when I think about like kind of the, the most crucial part, we also right now we invest more more kind of I would say resor resources to build I would say a full code infrastructure is on the car intake from B two B partners, right? So we work with. Uh, big fleet managers, car rental companies to remarket their cars to, to our dealership network. And for those, um, we basically, we build basically proper proper kind of foolproof code and also third party integrations to enrich the data. And given the, the current growth rate that you have, what is the, the, the biggest downside of your no code stack? Or where, do you see some places where actually uh, uh, with your co-founder, you're realizing, okay, we need to move away from no code for some parts because it's gonna, Block us in our growth. It's gonna slow us down. So I think it's mostly the the stability and reliability, right? So obviously, as our business grew, it's no longer okay for us to have a twenty four hour downtime because of bubble, because of Airtable, right? And this these are unfortunately the things that started happening as we grew the scale. Sometimes because of them, sometimes because of us, right? It's in the end the problem is that limited observability and limited. Um, understanding or, or kind of support from those platforms became an issue for us, right? So I would say for, this is kind of, you know, more of a risk, risk related topic, right? Where majority of your business relies on a no code tech stack, right? That you don't have control over. You also give up a big part of a control over your product to, to a third party, right? And obviously uh, the, the third parties we use are, are based in the US, right? So obviously the, the support take some time to, to resolve the issues, right? And I remember that when I think we had this big uh, Airtable outage or bubble outage, right? That basically our business stopped for 24 hours, right? And this this is something we could afford in the early days, right? Where th this is, you know, just one of the pain points you, you need to just accept when, when you grow the business. I think we got to the point where obviously this is, in many cases, not acceptable. And we obviously try to figure out which elements of our tech stack need to become full code to, to avoid those issues. And actually, last time that we uh, we, we we had a chat uh, in a, in a local club event, you mentioned that you are looking for uh, for a CTO or uh, a lead engineer, head of engineering. 
did you find that person and uh, what's our what our country plans on actually integrating full code into your infrastructure yeah so we, we did bring engineering um background to, to the company right like a full full code engineering background with uh, chris who's our head of engineering uh for the last four months and i think one of the biggest learnings for us actually i would say post factum learning right when he came in and started assessing the tech stack he said it would be a very different picture if we had someone like him from the beginning even if we built in no code right so obviously a lot of engineering choices we've made didn't have any engineer involved in it right so obviously uh, this is something where I think many kind of early stage companies don't realize, right? Because no code is so easy, right? Everybody can build it. Everybody can build backend, right? But I think at some point, if there is no engineer involved in building this backend, right? Giving a guidance on how to set up the architecture, this is something that catches up with you, right? And I mean, Bubble and Airtable uh, sync and infrastructure that we build between those two tools, I think is a probably one one of the biggest nightmares for some of the team members that sit in the first row because it's it's not properly thought through, right? And this is something we need to fix. Interesting. So basically you're saying that even with no code, you can end up with some technical debt. Exactly. Super interesting. Uh, from, uh, from the recruiting process, how difficult was it for you to find uh, uh, a head of engineering when you told them that you had a full no code infrastructure? Was it a problem at all or? I think I think the biggest challenge was to find someone who writes out basically right on the first meeting wouldn't say, oh, I want to rebuild everything, right? I think we, we probably 99% of candidates we rejected in the re recruitment process exactly had this attitude of, I'm going to come in and rebuild everything for, from day zero without any assessment, right? And for us, really what was important is that we find someone who, who might come from the full code background, right? Might come from only building full code apps, but will actually invest time to understand how to make the best of the both worlds, right? So uh, I think it would be a, a kind of, you know, sad, sad outcome if we decided to just scrape everything we did and just suddenly become full code company because there are a lot of advantages of no code, right? Full, a lot of advantages for our teams that we still have this full uh, no code backbone. And I think going forward, we obviously want to keep this agility, flexibility that comes with the no-code tools, while at the same time, strategically using full code where, where it's needed, where the core of the core basically needs, we'll, we'll say constant, will not really change. And so I think the hiring process of an engineer could be one thing where no-code could be difficult. I guess, you know, the second one that comes to mind, uh, with, given, given the age of your company, is like fundraising. How much of an issue or how much of, of an advantage is, was, was it to be to, to just present yourself as, look, we build everything on no code? Uh, what were the interaction with the business managers? And I, I guess also later when you, when, you, when you close your seed round, how much of that uh, raised some, some questions from investors? Yeah, I, I would say that due diligence process of VCs is obviously the, the one that's maybe not the, the most technical one. Let's put it this way, right? So we obviously had a lot of discussions where VCs just didn't care. I think obviously the ones where we went deeper in the uh, discussion, I think, so, so it has a potential risk, right? And I think it came much more from the side of there is a big team, right, that doesn't have anyone with technical background in it, right? It wasn't even the choice of the tools that we've made, but rather the worry that basically there is no head of engineering, there is no CTO, right? And basically who thinks through whether what we built is correct, whether it's scalable, whether it will it will... Uh, allow us to accomplish the, the business results, right? So I would say this came up a lot in the discussions. Um, I wouldn't say it was a, a problem at all at the pre-seed stage, right? At the pre-seed stage, you just have to build the scrappiest, leanest version of what you what you want to basically deliver as a value and just run with it. Um, at seed stage, it became a point of a discussion where we had to basically prepare and present a clear plan on what's going to change before we reach the next milestone of series a series b uh, which doesn't mean that you know as i said right doesn't mean that no code disappears it's much more about how do we evolve what we have into much more durable um, sustainable setup and was it at any at any point of time did you answer when people ask you uh how do you do if you don't have any engineer in your organization did you reply yeah but half of my team knows how to build systems is it something that you see for you as a value to have actually almost everybody in your team being able to build systems and things, things in terms of the system? I think it's it's a lot of value add. Obviously, 
I would say not everyone should be able to build everything in every system, right? Because this is uh, asking obviously for for a disaster. I think um, the best setups we 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 have seen, right, is basically having a, a core application handled by the core team, and then for instance Airtable, where we have core data synced into one database, then basically it can be synced to other databases where other people can build stuff on top, right? So here obviously. You know, you, you don't want marketing team to 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 ask for engineering resources because they want to test a new email send out, right? They should be able to pull the data they need and build a simple automation to to basically run the test. So I think the the dream setup also going forward is exactly keeping this distinction into there is a core infrastructure that is maintained by engineering. There is a no code infrastructure that is being used by by everyone who who needs to use it or wants to use it with a proper training. And it's quite an atypical setup. So how do you find the, the right people? How do you hire people and find find the people that you can put in that kind of setup that, that will come with a business function, but we also need to be able to say, hey, you're not going to have engineers building things for you because we can afford them. So we want you to come and build the things. We'll give you data, we'll give you systems, and we want you to basically build on top of this. How do you, how do you look for people? How do you find them? Yeah, so I would say... It's really hard to find people with no code background to join into the business function, right? It's not like I guess majority of those people are actually on this conference in Berlin, right? So this is the pool of talent that that we, we would be limited to. So obviously we need to look broader. And I think for us the, the important part is whether this person coming into organization with a proper training can actually use those systems, right? So I think we've had a, a good experience with people coming from um, investment banking M A background, for instance, right? Who who are used to working with Excel them onboarding on Airtable systems and understanding how to build on top of Airtable was pretty fast, right? So we see that certain types of profiles can actually transfer the abilities to to leverage full power of no code. But I would still say that a lot of a lot of kind of uh, improvement comes with the training. Uh, we're also working with you, right? So with 9x to to deliver it um, and actually upscale people not to be able not to do only basic stuff, but also more advanced and advanced um, elements of using basically the tools we have. And I, I think, you know, you've been very vocal in, in the past and you've always marketed your company as, you know, being a no-code no -code first company. Uh, how much, how much of AI do you, do you try to infuse in that, uh, in that DNA? Is it uh, something you're, you're working on or what's the, how do you yeah. see the, the opportunities for you there? Yeah. So obviously I think if you wanted to pitch to VCs, obviously it would be AI driven marketplace because this is Calido. what's AI. Uh, this is what's hot, hot now. But I think the the real truth is that in our business model, which is very operational, the AI use cases are very limited and very, I would say, specific to certain processes that we run. Obviously, it means, it doesn't mean we don't use AI. We still have a, elements of process where AI is applicable, right? So for instance, we collect the car data from the sellers where we get the pictures of cars, right? So they're obviously use case of AI, right? And we, we actually pilot now a new provider who who basically offers AI as a service for for this type of uh, pictures. You mean for for damage recognition? For for damage condition, yeah, exactly. Um, another use case, which for instance we built internally, was that early on we figure out that for our type of business, that actually what what will what will allow us to actually succeed is um, organic, I would say, traffic excellence, right? So basically, sell. And we obviously look into different AI tools that, that help you create great art articles. And our conclusion was that none of them were actually great. And so we decided to build our own uh, AI engine to, to go from, there is an idea of what we want to write for with keywords, right? To actually get almost ready article that can be uh, checked by a, by, by a human and actually published, right? So this is, I would say, example of non-core workflow where AI basically streamlined uh, our processes and allowed us to, to basically build a content machine, right? That otherwise, you know, big big companies like Carwar needs, I mean, you need a whole editorial team to, to run, right? We, we don't do, do this. Except revenue generation, how did you overcome investor concerns about building on Nokun? I would say it's mostly about having a clear plan and understanding of limitations of your current setup, the risks, and being able to communicate them, right? And um, in our case, we had a really good understanding of, of limitations of no code when we went for a seed round. 
uh, because we had certain experiences, right? Of works, what works, what doesn't work. We had advisors who who gave us a, a potential picture of how this could look like. So I think it's much more about being clear on how no code fits your part of a journey of a startup journey right now, rather than I would say being an a no code evangelist, right? Trying to convince investors, yeah, no code will stay with us until we IPO, right? Like I think you know, like you you see big companies. Uh, I think we, we have people from Finn here, right? I think Finn uh, started integrating SAP, right? And this is completely normal that at a certain stage of the company, you bring enterprise level solutions because they just work much better than what you could achieve with, with maybe certain tools, right? So I don't think it's about no code per se. It's about having the, the right person in the team, the right advisors who can clearly help you shape the vision of how this setup evolves because I can assure you that, unfortunately, the answer of we're always gonna stay with Bubble and you know we'll grow with Bubble to to do the IPO is is not an answer for for any investor really. And uh, it's it's interesting because it uh, it goes into one of the next question. Like someone asked at at which phase uh, a tech person join like should you have a tech person be involved in the you know in development process and not necessarily just building but as as we were saying. Uh, I think in building, there's two parts. There's coding and there's engineering. And as you say, there's engineering decision that you need to make. At which moment would you recommend somebody to uh, who's starting his company to get advice on, uh, you know, looking around for some somebody who could bring some engineering um, advice on how they are setting up the, the system? So, so I would say you need to be fast. You need to be scrappy, right? So obviously, you, you want to build basically things maybe without thinking. But I would say it does help if you have this person earlier, right? So it's not even about this person making a change into the way you build, but making you aware that right now you're doing this, this is what it's going to mean for you in three months, six months, 12 months, right? And I think this is something where we underinvested at the time, right? We, we built really fast, really a lot. And then obviously now we need to catch up a little bit into making sure that, you know, the setup we have is actually stable, is working, is scalable. I think one of the specificity of uh, of Cardino is that you decided to go with no code to build almost everything, uh, and now I mean we already touched on, on on that. You are trying to move towards also having a the core product built with a, a proper tech infrastructure. Are there still examples also of you know one thing that someone decided to build you know in at some moment and you know in a couple of days he built something and this has a, a tremendous impact for the company like you know internal tools. If you can give a couple of examples of things that either you or someone from the team built just it changed a lot for a lot of people. It was just someone just taking something and just going for it. And after a couple of days, everybody was happy he did it. Yeah, I would joke that every Slack automation is like this, right? Because it really makes it makes people remember about uh, certain processes. But um, so I would say the I would say the the thing is that with no code, you can test stuff super fast. So I think with with Tosan who sits here, right? I think last. A year ago, actually, we we built a pilot of new type of car sales where we basically did buy nows on the platform. It was actually on on pre-sale cars, right? So the ones that are available if within four weeks. We built an MVP within I think three days. We generated in in the first week something like ten thousand euro in revenue, right? So this this was an example of a f test that went really well. In the end, we had other problems with on the business side with that, but um, I think the the whole beauty of no code is actually that you build a simple automation error table, you run it, it solves for eighty twenty for the problem you have, so generates value already, and then you can actually spend time on thinking through. All right, now obviously eighty twenty is not good enough for long term, so you need to make it better, right? And we have example of different processes at Cardino where we did this. Um, I think a good example was when we had problems with our picture taking up, where we basically build a form on Airtable to collect pictures from sellers. And since then, obviously, we, we moved into, if you don't complete the journey on our app, then you get an email with a link to our platform where you can upload the pictures, right? So really good. No code allows you to really well test MVPs, prove the value that MVP, prove the MVPs that the feature will bring. So then, then you can decide to invest more resources to build it, right? Or you can decide to kill it. Uh, so you mentioned that you were you you went through this. Uh, uh, it's another question. You you went through this uh, transition from saying forty cars a month to four hundred cars a month in a relatively, relatively short amount of time. 
what were the parts, what were the biggest uh, friction, what were the, the, the biggest growing pains that the organization had to, uh, had to suffer during that process? I would say that the biggest problem is that when you have this integrated, um, I would say, no-code setup into your daily operations, that it often means that your business processes evolve together with the with the product, right? And I think this is something where we didn't realize soon enough that some business processes were simply not ready to be automated, right? So we automated a lot of processes from a get-go and then realized, okay, maybe you should have first thought through how the process should look like before we automate. But it was basically, as we said, right? You have this hammer, you have those nails, you just go for it, right? Um, so I would say... Uh, the, the biggest learning for me here is that sometimes you should really think through what you want to do, how you want to do it before you build it, even in no-code, right? And I think in the full-code organization, it's much more natural because the resources are much more expensive. It takes more time, so you really have to plan ahead. You have these waterfall projects, right? Uh, in no-code, it's much more agile. But I think it also means that you, you sometimes need to have maybe added level of scrutiny that, you know, maybe... Maybe let's let's actually plan it before we build it. Let's not build first, right? Um, so obviously this is, I would say, a constant discussion, right? Because um, no code pushes you to test a lot of stuff to do to break things fast. But I think the moment you try to build something that's gonna be used for longer and it's gonna need to hit the scale, I think then you need to take a step back and really think it through. Awesome.